Glad to see you here in the auditorium, the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. This is Preacher Edward speaking, and we welcome every one of you, and you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. We welcome you that's listening in the radio listening audience. If you call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. I do believe we can be a blessing to them. And we appreciate our visitors. We have visitors with us today. We're glad you're here. May the Lord bless you. I'm speaking on the subject, how to have God to be your friend. We all like friends. I do, and I know you do, and I want God to be my friend. I'm going to tell you how that God will be our friend if you follow me closely in the scriptures. I'm reading from two places in the Bible. I'm reading from uh, the book of John chapter 15. And I'm reading from over in the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Now this will be tape number 312. Tape number 312. You write in and say, Preach Edward, send me the tape on how God could be my friend. Or just send me tape number 312. Now if you're not getting the daily broadcast, you tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon and get the broadcast. Monday through Saturday. man called me yesterday from Waynesville, North Carolina. Said, Preach Edwards, I really enjoy your radio program in Waynesville, North Carolina. And so I thank God for the good coverage we have through this giant station, WNGC, here in Athens. And let me hear from you. This is a faith ministry. I depend upon you that love God and work with me in getting out the gospel. It's a real whole mission work. It's not a fly-by-night ministry. I've been on the radio here in Athens in my 40th year daily. And you know by that, it's not a fly-by-night ministry. Well, worthy of your prayers and your support. And I want you to pray about it and stand by this home mission work. Remember, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, the zip code number. Just before I read my text, I want to say just another word or two about our proposed Holy Land tour. Time is, of course, running out. And one reason I'm saying this is because I've had several people say, Preacher Edwards, before you discontinue your Holy Land tours, I want to go. Well, I may not go anymore after this year or this next year. And so uh, if you're planning to go with me, you might need to get on this next tour. It'll be a tour in March of next year. And the price is real reasonable. Uh, less than $1,200. That covers your motels, your plane tickets, your meals, and everything except your domestic ticket from Atlanta to New York and back, which would be less than $200. And so it's a real good price-wise trip. And we're going to Israel, and this is an 11-day tour. We're going to the beautiful Red Rock Road city of Petra, where the Jews will be driven during the tribulation period. We'll be in Amman, Jordan for two nights, and then over in Israel for the, uh, the balance of the tour, and be going to the great, wonderful places in Israel. Mount Calvary, the Garden Tomb. Take a ride on the Sea of Galilee. Go to the Dead Sea. Go to Masada. Masada is where the Jews, some almost a thousand, committed suicide rather than be captured by the 10th Roman Legion. And it took several years for the Roman Legion to capture Masada. And those Jews committed suicide rather than be taken. And we'll visit that place. Go up there by cable car. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful tour. Now, you need to get in touch with me immediately, right away. Some of you out in the radio listening audience, you ought to send your pastor. No greater thing could you do for your pastor, your pastor and his wife, is to send them. Get in touch with me. Give me a call. Write to me. And let me hear from you right away because we've got to get things squared away right away if you plan to make this tour in March of next year. You only have to put a little down payment. The balance will be due, due later on uh, in this year. I said next year. I forgot about we already in 1988. I'm, I'm talking about nay. I'm talking about this year, not 1890 or uh, 1989. I'm talking about 1988. Well, I'm uh, still thinking I'm back in 1987, I suppose. Well, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Proverbs chapter tw chapter 18. 
And I want these verses to stick to your ribs and mine. And verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now that one is the Lord Jesus, of course. And a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Would you like to have friends? All right. Show yourself friendly. Now John chapter 15. And beginning with verse uh, 12. Jesus here talking to his disciples. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. Now notice verse 14. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Did you get that? Jesus said you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So there's your key there. If you want to be a friend of God, you want God to be your friend, then Jesus said you do what I command you and I'll be your friend. And so I'm going to find out from a man where much scripture times was allotted in the Old Testament to this particular man. And one of the peak men in the, in the history of Israel and in the Bible. And that man was none other than Abraham. Abraham was God's friend. Three times in the word of God, God said, Abraham is my friend. God tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 7 that Abraham is my friend. God tells us in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 8, he said, Abraham is my friend. God tells us in James chapter 2 in the New Testament in verse 23 that Abraham is my friend. And three times in the Bible, God refers to Abraham as being his friend. Now, if I know my heart, I want God to be my friend. I want to be God's friend. I like to have friends on the earth. And so this message will help us in both respects. That is, friends on the earth and God being our friend. Let's go back and take a peep at what Abraham did that God might call him his friend. Now, surely there's something Abraham must have done that God said he is my friend. Abraham is my friend. I'm going to tell him what I'm doing. I won't keep any secrets from him. I'm going to bless him. I'll make him a great nation. He's my friend. So remember, three times in the Bible, God said, Abraham is my friend. I've given you that scripture. Now let's find out some things that Abraham did. And you can do these things. And I can do these things. And we can say, God is my friend. I don't know any friend any greater than Jesus. I'd rather have him with me than all the world. I really had. And I, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you day and night. And you need him to be your friend during this year, uh, 1988. You need that. We're living in perilous times, momentous days. Land's filled, the land is filled with crimes and criminals and murders and rapes and whatnot. And you're going to need God. You're going to need a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. First of all, the Bible said Abraham believed God. Now you can't doubt God and say, now he's my friend. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible said, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. So in order to say God is my friend, you got to believe him. You can't doubt this book. You can't question this book and expect God to be your friend. You have a lot of infidels and liberals and modernists that uh, butcher this book up, but they are not God's friend. No, sir. They can't say God is my friend. And God can't say you're my friend. Now, if you butch up the Bible, disbelieve the word of God, then God is not your friend. I don't care who you are. In, the, in Nineveh, that great city that caused Israel so much trouble, that Jonah didn't want to preach to him, went and preached to him anyway. And uh, when God got through with him, he went and preached to the Ninevites. And the Bible said the people in Nineveh Believe God. Now when they believe God, God spared the city. Now there's more in just believing God than just merely saying something about that. Do you believe God? If you believe God, then God will tell you what to believe in this book. Believe what God said in this book. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do. Now I had a great preacher, outstanding international evangelist. 
When he first started out in the ministry, he just uh, seemed couldn't get his feet on the ground. And, and he was desperate, just about to quit the ministry. And so he didn't know what to do and went out in the woods one day and took his Bible and closed it up and said, God, I want you to show me some scripture. Let this book fall open to a verse of scripture that'll get my feet on the ground. He went out there and he opened his Bible. It fell open and fell open there in the book of um, a Jonah. And the devil said, well, there's nothing in the book of Jonah for you. And the first thing he saw was that verse of scripture where it said, uh, and the Ninevites believed God. That's all it took. He shut that Bible up, began to praise God, shout the victory. He said, that's been my trouble. I haven't believed God like I should. I haven't believed uh, what God said in you like I should have believed it. I haven't believed God's promises from here on in. I believe God. And he did. And that man spent many fruitful years in the ministry because he believed God. If you want to be God's friend, you believe God. Secondly, you must be willing to obey God. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, it said, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should have to receive an inheritance, obeyed, he went out, not knowing where he went. Abraham obeyed God. He didn't understand why he was going, but he obeyed God anyway. God said, Go, and he went. There was a young preacher one time that took advantage of every place he could find to preach. And uh, God laid on his heart and said, I want you to go to the old sawmill place over there and, and preach to those lumberjacks. And so he went over to the old sawmill place, and lo and behold, when he arrived on the scene, there wasn't a soul there. The old lumberjacks had left. And he said, now, I, I know God told me to come over here and preach, and I'm going to preach. And he went out into the mess hall that had a building erected for the mess hall where they ate the food, and got on the inside of it, arranged him a little pulpit, sang a song or two, took out his Bible, read his text, and preached like he's preaching to a thousand people. Man, he really laid her out. But what had happened, when those lumberjacks had left, uh, they found out they'd forgotten a saw, and they said to a young boy about 18 years old, son, I want you to go back and get a saw we left over there. And so when he arrived back at the camp, he heard that singing, and he just sat down on the outside of the building to see what was going on in there, and he heard every word of that sermon. And God got a hold of his heart, and he got down on his knees, Asked God to save him and slipped away. The man doing the preaching never knew there's anybody on the outside. He was only doing what God told him to do. Several years later, that preacher was visiting the mission field. Young man came up and said, Sir, did you ever preach at a certain lumber camp when there wasn't a soul there to hear you preach? He said, Yeah, I sure did. Many years ago, I sure did, son. How'd you know about that? He said, You just thought there's nobody there. That I was sitting on the outside of that building and God got a hope of me and saved my soul, called me to the mission field. I've been trained in school for the mission field and I've been over here on the mission field now for a period of time. I'm glad to meet you, sir. I'm glad you obeyed God. So you see, you must do what God tells you to do, whether it looks right, feels right or not. You must do it anyhow. And so he did. And then you must separate yourself unto God. God said, now Abraham's my friend because he's going to live a separated, clean, pure life. He's my friend. And if you read Genesis chapter 12 and the first four verses, you find that Abraham separated himself from there of the Chaldees and headed off toward the land of Canaan. God said, old Abe, he's never been there, but he's my friend because he's doing what I told him to do. Now, you must obey God, do what God tells you to do. No doubt Abraham said, well, Pa, I'm going to leave you, not, and I, I, I'm going over into a land I've never seen. Some of the neighbors said, Abe said, uh, where are you going? He said, well, uh, I don't know where I'm going, but uh, I'm going anyway. He said, I'm going way over in the land I've never been. They said, well, old Abe, he's been out in the sun too much with his head off. We always thought he acted a little odd. And I said, uh, went on his way. Somebody said, what's your name? So he said, my name's Abram. He said, uh, I, I, that means that I'm a, a father, Abram. He said, where's your children? He said, don't have any. Oh, oh, your name's Abram, meaning you're a father and don't have any children. No, I don't have any children yet, but uh, that's, that's, that's what it means anyway. Uh, I'm a father of children. And a little later on, somebody said, hey there, fellow, uh, Pilgrim, where are you going? He said, I'm going where God told me. He goes, what's your name? He said, my name's Abraham. Abraham uh, said, where's your children? Don't have any. 
All right, so Abraham means the father of nations. You mean that you're going to be the father of nations? That's what my name is, what God said. And I believe God, and he moved on. Oh, they said the old man acts funny, doesn't he? Well, he said he believed God. Well, he doesn't have sense of no way he's going, but he's going somewhere. But Abraham believed God. You must believe God. Separate yourself unto the Lord. There's an old man one time. His cow got out and lost his temper and hunted that old cow. And went up and down on one side of the creek and up and down on the other side of the creek. And out in the woods and couldn't find his cow. And looking around, came in. He called his wife. He said, come out here. Said, uh, said we got to find that devilish cow. Said, uh, I'll tell you what you do. Said, uh, you go down on this side of the creek and I go down on the other side of the creek because that cow might be on both sides of the creek. Now we have a lot of church members like that. They're on both sides of the creek at the same time. Now you can't serve God that way. You got to be on the right side of the creek if you're going to serve God. You can't say good God on Sunday and good devil on Monday. Serve God on Sunday and and uh, offer up a good uh, sanctimonious smile on Sunday and get out and frown like the devil on Monday. God wants you to live for him seven days a week separated. God said he called Abbas said he's my friend because he's living a separated life. And I'm going to bless him. I'm going to take care of him, make him a great nation. And I allotted, God allotted uh, much time and much scripture pertaining to this great man, peak man in the nation of Israel and in history. Number four, God said Abraham's my friend because he believes in tithing. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, you said, now preach it, but you could have skipped over that point. Yeah, I know I could, but uh, I got to do what God tells me to do and preach the whole sermon. I'm not going to skip over anything. Now, Abraham was a tither. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Oh, you say, preacher, that's over in the Old Testament. Yes, in the New Testament too. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, the Holy Ghost said, Be sure to put down there now. And Abraham believed in the tithe. He tithed. See, he tithed before the law. Uh, tithing was um, uh, given before the law and during the law and after the law. Why, well, God started tithing in the Garden of Eden when he said, Adam, all these trees you see out here are mine. One tree is mine. You can have the rest of them. That's mine over there. Don't you bother my tree. Don't touch the fruit on my tree. You eat all the fruit on these other trees. The devil came in and said, I don't want these people tithing like that. Uh, I'm going to sick them on that tree and let them keep their tithe. And so he says, you eat uh, God's fruit. Eat, eat off of God's tree. Don't eat off of yours. You take God's. You know you have a lot of church members like that. They think they can take God's tithe. Spit it on this cell, spit it on everything comes along, spit it on what they want to, and, and uh, think that God will smile on Don't kid yourself. That tithe belongs to God. That's holy money. That tithe is to be used to support the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, you say, I'll just go out here and buy me a fiddle and uh, take God's tithe and buy me a fiddle. Well, God has nothing to do with that. God will let you get by the best way you can with your fiddle. Or you may say, now, preach it what I'll do. I'm going to train my children in, uh, in the musical realm. I'll just take my tithe and pay the teacher. No, no, you can't take God's money and do that. No, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. You should pay the teacher out of your own money. That's God's money. Now, you're to use God's money for God's business in supporting the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to send your children out here to school and train them, don't take God's money to do it. Take your own money and train them. God's money goes in supporting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God's a mighty good collector. And you better believe that because God expects you to tithe. Now you listen to me. You just keep your feet on the floor. Let me have your ears and look at the preacher. Look at the preacher. Every born again believer at least ought to give one dime out of every dollar to God's work. You ought to do it. That's God's money. That's not yours. That's God's holy tithe. Then, are you listening? Keep looking at the preacher. Look at the preacher. In addition to that, because Jesus has been so good to you, you ought to give him a little love gift along. Slip in a little extra, a little offering, a little love gift. Jesus, you've been good to me. Give him something extra. I'm going to tell you before God, and I base this on the word of God, God will open up the windows of, windows of heaven. God will take care of you. 
You take care of God's needs. God will take care of your needs. You take care of God's business. God will help you in your business. You ignore God. God will ignore you. Now you better believe that, beloved. Because the, the principle is all the way through the Word of God. Oh, you say preach the tithings under the law. Yes, before the law, in the law, under the law, out of the law, in the New Testament, all the way through the Bible. That principle is found, the principle of the tithe. But you shouldn't stop there. Everything you have really belongs to God. And you ought to give God a little love offering occasionally. And I could give you some illustrations after illustrations of people that robbed God and took God's money. And whenever God came around to collect, boy, didn't they have to dig up and bar and strain to try to meet their obligation. I know others didn't make very much, but they tithe. And first thing you know, they had a blessing coming here and a handful on purpose over there. And something came this way to help them. And, and they got some help here. And, and the old automobile tires lasted longer. The toothache didn't come around when they thought it was going to. And, and uh, man, they didn't have to run to, to see the, the doctor every day uh, like uh, uh, maybe some would that, that don't tie and so forth. Well, the things just worked out better. Now listen to me. Listen to me. You get this now. You may say, preach, I'm a tither, but I still have problems with my health and so forth. We all do. We all growing older. And we're going to have problems. We're going to have to see the doctor. And we're going to have to buy medicine. But one thing you can say, it's not because you didn't tithe. Now let that sink deep down in your ears. It's not because you didn't tithe. You can sleep well at night about that. But if you're not a tither, it may be because you didn't give God his part of your income. All right. Not charging anything for that. That's for your own good. And we find that Abraham was faithful to God. Now Abraham... Uh, would have been in church on Wednesday night. Abraham would have been in church on Sunday morning. Abraham would have been in church on uh, Sunday night. Abraham had been there every time you had a revival. In fact, to be honest, every time you open the church, so Abraham had been there. Old Uncle Abe believed in being where God was. Now, beloved, listen to me. God wants you to be faithful. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. One of the crying needs of the church during these days of apostasy in the Laodicean state of the church age is some faithful church members. God can't build churches without people. Preacher can't preach to lumber yards and get anything done for God. It takes God's people that are saved to have the name on the church roll to be faithful. Be faithful. Don't let every little thing come along and you take the hiccups and say, Well, I got a hiccups now. I guess maybe I'll just um, uh, lay out of church. I got a hiccups. Maybe like the man, his wife had the hiccups sitting out in the car and about to run him crazy. Stopped and went into the drugstore and said, uh, said, You got anything for the hiccups? The man said, yeah, I busted him in the back and almost knocked him down. Said, oh, I said, wait a minute. Said, it's not me. This is my wife out in the car. She's the one who got the hiccup. Sometimes you might kind of get mixed up like that. But don't let any little old thing keep you away from the house of God. Rain, snow, ice, sleep. No, don't let that keep you away. If you can get here, be here to serve God. If you don't feel good, you will be when you leave. So come on anyway. And so we must be faithful and then... Abraham was sacrificial. We don't have many people today that really sacrifice anything for God. We do what's convenient. We, we do what we uh, really want to do. If we have anything left over, we'll give that to God. We need to be sacrificial. Now, there's church members sitting at home this morning, and some of you right there out there now listen to me. If you want to hear what I have to say, you better stick your finger in your Don't you cut that radio off. This preacher's talking. Listen to me. You ought to be in God's house, and you know you ought to be in God's house. And just because uh, some rain came, you didn't come to God's house. And you grumbled up about um, two or three months. I wish it rain. Oh, let's pray for rain. Oh, if we could just get some rain. Got to give a garden plan. No rain. And then let a few drops of rain come. You sit at home on Sunday and say, well, I... I would go to a church today, but you know how it is out there. My wife's got the little baby's got the sniffles, and it's going to take me and my wife and, and Uncle Jim and 
It ain't maybe all of us to wipe our nose, so we, we just won't go today. But uh, it should be all right in the morning because we'll be going to work in the morning. It should be all right then. We have faith enough to believe that. But we'll sit at home, and, and if we uh, like what Preach Edward says on the radio, we'll listen. If we don't, I'll go in the kitchen and, and out in the yard and, and let listen to the dogs bark, let my wife listen to him. Oh, listen to me. God wants you to be faithful. Be found in the house of God. Be sacrificial. Sacrifice for God. Do something extra for the Lord. That's where the blessing comes in. Put forth that special effort. And do it for Jesus. You'll be glad you did. Ere this year comes to an end. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 17. By faith Abraham. When he was tried offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise. Offered up his only begotten son. Oh brother Abraham. Bless his heart. He had trouble in his home. And I don't know don't, don't many homes today. That don't have some kind of trouble. Problems with the children. Problems with the in-laws. Problem with the parents, problem with grandparents. Well, there's trouble, trouble in almost every home. Abraham worked hard to get that straightened out. And it, 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 just, it, it just broke his heart. He had to take Ishmael and Hagar out in the wilderness to keep Sarah's uh, mouth shut, keep him fussing all the time. And left her and Isaac in the tent. And he said, well, at last, uh, uh, Sarah won't have anything to fuss about. Uh, uh, she's gone. Um, Hagar's gone, Ishmael's gone, it breaks my heart, that's my boy out there in the wilderness. And I just, it just breaks my heart. But well, I guess everything will be all right now. I made a terrible sacrifice, had to carry Ishmael out there in the wilderness and Hagar, the Egyptian woman. And then uh, I guess everything, I can just shout from here on in. Then what happened? Like a clap of thunder out of a clear sky when there wasn't a thunderhead in sight. God said, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Lord, I want you to take your son, your only son of promise. I want you to carry him to the top of Mount Moriah. I want you to put him in an altar. I want you to take a knife, and I want you to sacrifice him on that altar and put him to death. Now, you're talking about a joke. There's a man there that just got through some trouble in his home and got that settled, and now he's got to take his only son of promise carry him up there on Mount Moriah and put him to death. He said, God, if that's what you want, I'm willing to do what you want. God said, that's what I want, son. Take him on up there. And he carried Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, placed him on the altar. Abraham grabbed his knife and going to put him to death. And of course, his son said, Father, you got the knife and the fire and everything. Where, where's the lamb? He said, God provide himself a lamb. And then while they were going up on one side of the mountain, Mount Moriah, little old lamb came ram walking up on the other side and made it to the top. He was there just in time. God said, Abraham, look over there in those vines. He looked over there in those vines and there was a little old ram over there, a lamb, and he was caught by the horns in those vines. And God said, Abraham, you go over and take that little animal and cut his throat and take the blood and put it on the take Let your son go. I want him to die in your son's place. Now the reason he's caught by his horns because he could not have a scar, a scratch, a bruise on him that that would destroy the type. And God let him get caught by his horns so there'd be no bruise or scar on him. And he took that perfect little old lamb, cut his throat, put the blood on the altar, Isaac got up, and that was it. And Abraham, the Bible said in the book of Hebrews, believed since God told him and make of him a great nation through Isaac, Abraham believed God, and Abraham said, If I'd have put my son to death, God have raised him from the dead, because God's already promised that he'd make out of him a great nation. He believed God. You've got to do some believing God if you want God to be your friend. You walk around and say, Well, it may happen, may not happen, if, it, if it's God's will. No, you, you need to believe God on some things. I mean, believe God, and God will help you. Abraham was a considerate man. He considered others. I could spend much time telling you how that he fought for Lot when Lot got into trouble and, and Abraham did all he could to help him and keep him out of trouble. He was a considerate man. Read Genesis chapter 18 verses 23 through 33. Abraham was God's friend. God said you take old Abe, he's my friend. And three times in the Bible we find God said Abraham is my friend. He said it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 7. 
He said in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 8. He said in James chapter 2 and verse 23. Then finally Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. He looked and longed for a great city. And he could see that city by faith away off. And he was headed in that direction. Now what did Jesus say in John chapter 15 verses 12 through 14? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends. Are you getting this? Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Jesus said you are my friends if I do whatsoever. If you do whatsoever I command you. Someone gave me a smile today. I tried my best to give it away to everyone I chanced to meet. As I was going along the street, but everyone I could see would give my smile right back to me. When I got home beside one smile, I had enough to reach a mile. The Bible said, if you want friends, you must prove yourself friendly. Tell you this in closing. Some of you have heard it. There was a man one time, businessman, great fella, uh, loved God. And they went to a business meeting one cold night. Awfully cold, with snow and ice on the ground, wind blowing. He went in for the business meeting. Time came for him to leave. He took his gloves, his top coat, and his hat, and he stepped out to go home. Out there beside him, an oak tree, stood a little old boy. No coat on, ragged shirt, barefooted, trembling like a leaf. Tears running down his little cheeks. This businessman walked up and said, Son, what are you doing out here a night like this? You'll freeze to death. Son, you go home. What, what, where do you live? He began to cry and his lips quivered. And he said, Mister, I can't go home. He said, Why can't you go home? He said, My daddy's a drunkard and he's drunk and he'll beat me and he beats mama. And said, He gave me uh, this piece of paper to come in the store to get some, something from the store. And said, he, he gave me some money and said, I guess my hand got so cold, sir, I lost the money and I can't go back home. He said, My daddy beat me to death. The Christian gentleman said, Son, let me have that little list you have in. Come with me into the store. They went to the store. That Christian man purchased everything in the store. It was on that list, put it in the bag. He said, Son, where do you live? He said, I live way down the street. He said, Come and I'll go with you and carry it for you. He said, You don't have to tell your daddy that what happened, everything he wanted is in this bag. They went down the street, on down, on down toward the slum area, on down where there's no lights. And they finally came to the little old hut. The little old boy said, uh, Mister, that's where I live. He said, All right, son, you take uh, this bag and go on in now. You don't have to tell your daddy you lost some money. Everything's in there. Don't worry about it. The little old fella took that bag of groceries in his arm and he started toward that little old shack. And then he stopped and he set it down. And he came running back to this man. He put his little old arms around him and squeezed him real tight and looked up at him and tears running down his cheeks. You know what he said? He said, Mister, I wish you was my daddy. I wish you was my daddy. That man said, Do you think I went home? No. He said, I walked up and down every street in that era to see if I could find another little boy that needed help. You get your greatest blessing out of helping others and be a friend to somebody, and God wants you to be a friend to Him, and He'll be a friend to you. If you'll do what this message told you to do this morning, you're going to have a great year. Let's stand up, feet. I want Debbie to come and play What a Friend We Have in Jesus. While she plays What a Friend We Have in Jesus, I want you to listen, and I want you to obey God. And you do what God tells you to do. Father in heaven, I pray today as we close this message that you'll help everyone in this building obey you and be your friend. May not a one of them be rebellious, hard-hearted and hard-headed against the message you've given us to give them. Lord, we know if they do, they're the loser.